this film, I watched it last night, Death of Me, and I didn't, I purposefully did not uh, watch any trailers. I, I did, I read literally nothing on it. I just knew it was you. Yeah. So I just wanted to give it a shot. I feel it's in a lot of ways, maybe your most mature film. It's a very, very interesting piece. Well, thank you. You know, it was a it was a weird one for me because you know usually I do movies that I'm attached to as a writer or as I've been developing for years. This was not. Um, this was a movie that came to me. Um, I had taken two years off of making movies, uh, and I was doing immersive theater. And you know I had that ink. I had that like thing in the back. I was like, I'm getting antsy. I want to do a movie. I want to do a movie. And um, I got offered this script from these producers that I'm really big fans of, David Tish and uh, Lee Nelson. And it was a much different script originally. Um, it was set in Haiti. It was, it was voodoo, it was Haitian horror, um, you know, with, with voodoo dolls and, and all kinds of things like that. And same premise, but I was like, you know, I feel like voodoo's played out. I've seen it. Um, and I don't know if I can do better than, you know, Serpent in the Rainbow or these other movies that are like, like giants. Yeah. So one of the first things we, we looked at doing was changing it, the mythology a little bit to giving it something that had a unique look to it, something that maybe audiences hadn't seen uh, from, a, from a look standpoint. And that immediately set itself up when we, when we realized we were going to Thailand. We were like, okay, that can be cool. What, what's a mythology we can base, base it on? knowing that we're going to put Thailand as kind of the backdrop to it. And then it happened rapidly after that. I was on a plane. Uh, it was a very quick shoot. It was a two week, like two weeks prep, 20 day shoot. And then like we edited it in like 10 weeks and it was done. Wow. Um, so the whole thing happened very, very, very quickly. Um, it took a long time to come out, but the actual process of, of making it was, was quick. And I think there's something exciting about that because you can't overdevelop. You can't overthink you're you're basically uh running and gunning it like it was you know when i was in film school almost well yeah there's a there's a, a i love the mythology of it and I, I don't think that's something that's been explored and of course you're making travels seem even scarier than you know. <laughs> well, it was, i'll tell you it was a, it was a it, one of the things that was interesting is I've, I've been really fortunate to be able to shoot in different countries and you know i i was able to go to, to to japan i was able to go to barcelona and now going to thailand there there are moments in each of those occurrences that that i felt completely like a fish out of water and a stranger in a strange land and i think that you know in thailand there was there was a few moments that i got lost and uh you know bangkok is a huge city it's huge and um the traffic unlike anything you've ever seen before and there were moments where I went out and my cell phone died and I had to navigate the streets. Now, Thailand or, or Bangkok is a very populated city and it's very, um, you know, it's very, there's technology and, and it's not like I'm in some remote village, but there are still moments that I felt lost. And without a cell phone, you realize how quickly things can go from you feel connected to the world to being no one knows where I am. I could disappear right now and no one would ever be able to find me in a million years. Mm. Uh, and I think that that is a, that's a scary idea is this fact that we feel safe now because we carry, I have Apple watches and I have iPads and cell phones and that, that gives you some false sense of security, but you take those instruments away and you are literally, you can disappear. And I think that that was just the, the idea of them waking up into a series of events, uh, passports gone, cell phone gone, uh, they're stuck on this island and they can't get off. Uh, I just thought that was just a cool... I just love that subgenre of horror, which is the very bad things happen to vacationers. Um, and then you mix that with my other favorite subgenre, which is folklore horror, which, you know, The Wicker Man, more, more recently, Midsommar, those type of movies. Like The Wicker Man growing up was one of my favorite, favorite films ever. So mm -hmm. this is kind of my homage to, uh, to Wicker Man a little bit, just set in a completely different place. Well, I also, you know, what I really liked it. What I appreciated it, it was very unexpected. It was a little batshit crazy in the best of ways because you don't really know where it's going and you don't kind of, you kind of follow along. And thankfully you have a, an actress like Maggie Q leading it because she fucking kills it. She yeah. nails it here. Yeah. Why did, what was, what was the reason for casting her and, and how did you get her involved? 
So casting on this movie was a, was a challenge for cultural sensitivity, I think, because one of the things that I wanted to make sure of, just from my own ideals and beliefs and moral, I guess, moral compass, I didn't want to do a movie of the savage natives where people come in and it's it's just a it's a it's a village of just horrible people. Yeah. So it started with Alex Essos first, which was that character Samantha. We wanted to make her. I wanted to make her Western because I didn't want everyone perpetrating the crime to be, uh, you know, of the island. And so yeah. we started with the mythology of what if this island was full of transplants and it was not from one place but numerous places. And so. It's hinted at throughout the movie, but then you meet Alex, you realize that she came to this island. And then you there's like the, the, the scene of the guy at the beach cafe who is obviously uh, not a native islander as well. And all these people that were complicit in this kind of manipulation of these two characters. Um, then we thought it was interesting that, you know, first off, Maggie, what I like about Maggie is she plays strong very well. She never plays a victim. She, she's defiant in, in her actions. Um, but also the, throughout the, something that we worked into the script that I didn't even realize when we cast her was people thought Maggie was Thai. And there was a scene in the movie where the doctor says, you speak Thai? And she's like, no, I'm American. And that the idea that, you know, they weren't targeting necessarily Westerners. They were targeting anyone who would be able to save this island. Yeah. And so one of the things that we really tried to hit in there was, um, the villagers aren't bad. They're not nefarious. They are people that are doing what they believe they have to, to protect their loved ones, their elders, their children. Um, and then posing that interesting question is if one person could die to save a thousand, is that that bad? I mean, they're saving a thousand people for this thing. And so it had a lot of things in there that I responded to just as a person, because that's shit that I go through my belief in faith and, uh, religion and uh, so it had a lot of things that I, I just respond to as a, as a filmmaker. Yeah, well, that's I, funny you bring up Midsommar. That was one of my favorite films of that year. And this, I feel like both your film and Midsommar do exactly what you're saying. There's you watch these people, and yes, they're the quote on villains, but there's yeah. something not quite villainous about them. Very human. Yeah, well, I think that you go back to religion. And I grew up Christian. I was grew, I grew up in a Christian household. You go back to the beginning of that belief system, and it dealt with sacrifice. And it dealt with, I mean, the whole idea about Christianity was the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus. Yeah. And so, how ridiculous is it to think that cultures believe in sacrifice and that sacrifice can offer salvation? Um, sacrifice has been prevalent in religion since the dawn of time. And so, who are we to make any sort of judgment on any culture? when when our culture was based in that like when you go back and look how i grew up it's based in those type of mythologies so i think that that's why i also respond to these type of movies is it's such a an interesting question and debate of you know i believe like i remember when my parents both got cancer and they're they're both fine now but when they both had cancer i spent a lot of time praying and you ask yourself, what am I doing? I'm, I'm praying to this theoretic supernatural being that lives in the sky and can grant wishes. How is that any more absurd of a belief than what this island believes? And I think that when you put it like that, I think that's why I'm fascinated by belief. <laughs> so, Well, it makes for an interesting subject in, within the horror world because you're dealing with fear and there's a lot of fear in religion. Yeah. You know, I... For one of the things that I always respond to with your films is you, you always have a very good, interesting look to the film. And this is a very interesting look. Can you talk about creating the, 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 the tone and the atmosphere in this, this world and, and making it smaller and kind of yeah. uncomfortable? <laughs> well, I think first thing is the, the, the DP, Jose, was, was uh, I saw a movie he did on Netflix called... Um, I think it was called Whatever Happened to Monday. It was uh, Naomi Rapis, and uh, uh, she played seven roles. She played all these different characters, and it was an action film, and I, I loved the look of it. Um, and so I met with this DP, and um, he he was kind of a, he was an interesting, I, I work with a lot of the same cinematographers, and he was the first time I'd worked with him. And he challenged me to step outside of my comfort zone into the way that we did pre-production and the way that we actually showed up on set. 
one of the things that we really wanted to do was is to have it look kind of beautiful in the way that it was set in this beautiful island. Um, the beautiful landscape rocks that you saw in the distance and the horizon and the water. Um, but as the film progressed, we wanted it to get more and more claustrophobic. And you see like in scenes where Luke Hemsworth character is out looking for Maggie and he gets caught in the middle of that parade. And all these people are surrounding him with these crazy masks and they're dancing around and they're joyous and they're celebrating. I wanted it to start feeling more and more confined by just the way that they were manipulated and crowded. Mm. Um, and I think that Jose did such a, a fantastic job on that. Uh, the cinematography was great. And the music, I think, adds so much to this movie. Thank um, you. I was going to say, the music is yeah. incredible. Yeah, so Mark Seyfritz, who did the, did the score on this, was the guy that I used on Abattoir and St. Agatha. That's and great. I loved what he was able to do with those, with those two um, scores. Uh, you know, scenes that are very mundane, he comes in and makes them frightening and scary and dramatic. So he's, um, he has become one of my favorite tools in my arsenal um, because he can take something that doesn't really work and make it really, really scary. Um, so I think when you combine the, the cinematography and, and Mark's score, it just, it, it works. Yeah, that, that, that score, I, I remember starting the, the film last night and just being like transfixed by just the music alone. Yeah. I, I, I I feel like that's such an important part. I feel like you've always been kind of, you always work with interesting people for that. Yeah, score to me, music is everything. I mean, music is so, so, so important. Um, and you know, a, a kind of a funny, interesting note on Mark, he was not the original composer. Um, he was originally not available. And uh, I hired this, uh, this other uh, composer who was great, guy was fantastic, but it just when I when I heard the score the first time it didn't it didn't do what I wanted it to do, and it was an amazing score. Just I have a very specific style, um, and uh, I called Mark up and I was like, "Dude, I'm mixing in two weeks. Can you do something here?" And Mark turned out this score. He was became available and turned out the score in two weeks, which is insane. Wow, wow. Yeah. No, it's honestly, dude. This is one of those movies that. You, you you are pulled into and it, the cast is great I, I i love i love that we're seeing more of alex i think she's such a marvelous actress she's great i mean starry eyes was one of my favorite films when it came out it was yeah. definitely my favorite genre of the year um and then um you know getting to see her in dr sleep uh i mean she had she was such an amazing wendy torrance um and she keeps popping up in these movies that that i'm like shit she's she's awesome so i it was, it was great to be able to spend time with her in Thailand too, because, you know, we shot the movie out of order and it was, what that basically did was it made Maggie Q um, running constantly for every single second to run back to her trailer, change clothes, fuck up her face, fuck up her hair, run back to set. So there was a lot of downtime that we were waiting. And so I just got to hang out with Maggie and Luke. And uh, it was, it was fun getting to, to hang out with those two because I didn't know Luke Hemsworth that well outside of Westworld. I mean, I mean, I loved him in Westworld. And now, you know, he kind of going against type or he is a, he's a big dude. He's a, he's a Hemsworth. He's a tough dude. And then kind of playing him meeker and more, uh, you know, with the, he just was a more of a meek character. I thought he did fantastic too. So I was, I was really in my, a, a note on the cast, which is interesting. I would say 75% of our Thai actors were, were people we found on the street. Um, or people that we went up to and, and would ask them, do you want to be in a movie? Wow. And it would get them to, and we, you can never do that in America, but there I wanted authenticity and I wanted the look of the, this village to, ha to, to have this feeling. And so we were able to really go like the day or two before and, and I mean, like, I love this woman and she's great. Can we get her? And they'd go up and ask her. And um, so, so I, I love some of the Thai actors, like that cab driver in the very beginning when he starts yelling at them when he's telling them to go around. Like, there's just some great Thai character actors in this. I think are just awesome. Well, I and speaking of that, that that kind of element, I love the fact that you chose not to. There's no subtitle. There's you don't know what they're saying. You yeah. unless you speak Thai, <laughs> and I don't. What, what, why was that the, the decision? Obviously, keep the mystery, but was there more to do? Yeah, well, I wanted to, a couple of things, yes. So I wanted, I wanted um, the audience to kind of be in Maggie and or Christine and, and, and Luke Hemsworth's 
headspace. Uh, and they didn't know what they were saying. Those two actors didn't know. So I didn't yeah. want the audience to know. But more, more importantly, if someone were to be able to translate it and speak Thai, they're not saying what you think they are. Uh, and I think that was something fun that we wanted to do is this was something, a spoiler for those that haven't seen the movie, the town knew that this had to happen. They knew that this was going to be done. So it's not like they're figuring it out. Like they already knew this was happening. So what they're saying on camera is very mundane. So like when, when she goes to the doctor's office and the doctor is yelling at his nurse and it's very intense, they're arguing over lunch, not what Christina's doing. They're like, I want this to eat. And she's like, you're too fat. I'm not getting that for you. And so he's looking at Christine and he's yelling at the nurse. And as an audience, you're supposed to assume they're arguing about Christine, our, our Maggie Q's character, which they're not. They're arguing about what to eat for lunch. Um, and so I love the idea that this was not, this was planned out in advance and they were, just, they, were, they were just following through with the plan. So what they're actually saying is not what we as an audience assume it is. Yeah, it's not that insidious, like, ooh, no, get you. No. Why, I had, that's brilliant. That's yeah. absolutely brilliant. So I think that was, I think that was cool. The other thing that was, there was a challenge about shooting in Thailand was we, we originally cast an amazing actress to play the world, uh, the, the character of Kanda, and Kanda was the one that worked at a tattoo shop. Yeah. So we originally cast this actress who did a great audition. She was a great audition. And then we showed up on set and we realized that that character had to speak Thai and English, that she phonetically learned how to say the things in English. And so she didn't understand English and she didn't speak it. And we were doing major rewrites on the script and she had like a six page dialogue scene the next day. And there was no way in hell that she was gonna be able to phonetically say it and make it sound believable. So we had to replace that actress after day one, and we brought in Kelly, who is also a Thai actress, but is able to speak perfect English and Thai. Oh. So there was a lot of, and more than any movie I've done in the last 10 years, guerrilla tactics in the way that we got the movie, shot it, um, cast it. Uh, so it was, um, it was almost like going back to square one for me as a filmmaker and just the way that I approached having to shoot it. Well, it's, it's really fantastic. And I, I you know, I, we, we've talked a little bit. I want to talk because we got Halloween coming up and you have some surprises for us, which I don't really know what it's about. Can you tell me? I'm excited. <laughs> so um, for those that have followed my career, I'm really into immersive theater. And, uh, you know, immersive theater, for those that aren't, um, you know, as fans of it as I am, it basically is when you allow the audience to take an active role in the narrative. So if you see a movie like Death of Me, nothing you do will change the movie. It will always be Death of Me. You can scream at the screen, you can hate it, you can love it, and it will always just be there in that. Immersive theater changes based on how you interact with it. Um, so I started a few years ago doing these really complex, very big shows in Los Angeles that you would actually show up to like a Westworld. You showed up to a building and you were able to interact with the actors and the set. And it was what's called a sandbox, which means you can do whatever you wanted within rules of our confines. You couldn't touch an actor, but they you can touch you though. They can touch you. <laughs> they uh, touch me. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, it's, it's, they're not haunted houses because no one wears masks or jumps out. They're not scary like that. They just challenge you. Yeah. So, you know, now that the pandemic is here, I wanted to do something that, played in the immersive space, but from the safety of people's own homes. So I partnered with a screenwriter friend of mine named Joshua Dietz, and I'm in huge into magic. In the last uh, four or five years, I've really got into sleight of hand and card tricks and things like that. Um, and I partnered with these two insanely talented magicians, uh, Daniel Garcia and Blake Voigt. Those two guys, you won't know their names necessarily, but you know who they are and the tricks they've done. They both work for, have worked for David Copperfield, David Blaine, and they're, they're huge creators of magic. So we partnered together and we had this idea of what if we sent a box to someone's house and that box was unlocked at the beginning of the show and um, the box held the secret to the show and they had to interact with the box. So you buy a ticket and we send a box to your house and you will participate in like an online seance um, with actors and sets and you will use the things inside the box and it will go horribly awry and it's not what you think it is. 
um, and it's called One Day Die. We put tickets on sale yesterday, which I don't know when this is going to air, but tickets went on sale uh, on Wednesday, and they sold out in four hours. So now we are going to extend the show based on the demand and reopen tickets back up on Monday. But we sold out, you know, everything. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tickets to this thing uh, almost immediately. So there, it's it's exciting because you know, what are you going to do for Halloween? Well, I've got a show for you that's macabre, it's dark, it's fun. Uh, and you get a, a really cool souvenir at the end of it, this box and the contents of the box. Well, and I'll tell you, I, I, I had the pleasure of going to one of those. As I said, I got touched. And it was one of the coolest. I, I, I remember the experience at like it really happened. Yeah. yeah. So I highly, I, I'm so excited for it. I forgot, you went, did you go, to, you went to Theater Macabre, I think, right? I did, yes. Yeah, so yeah. the thing that's just so great about these is you get what you, you, you get out of it what you put in. So on and shows like that, there are infinite possibilities. So you saw one of 33 storylines and each storyline has 10 different outcomes. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a like a choose your own adventure meets the game, uh, the Michael Douglas film meets Westworld. Um, so if people are looking for things to do this Halloween, uh, you're looking for something a little more interesting then I recommend one day die and you can get to it at one day die.com. That's amazing. And Darren, thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.